Hi guys, welcome back to the tokenomics design playlist. Today we're talking about step four, incentive mechanisms. As a brief reminder, this is for educational purposes only. It's not legal, financial, technical, or investment advice. This is step four in our seven step tokenomics design process. So if you're diving in here, you probably wanna go back a few, uh, few videos to the first video where we cover objectives and requirements. The first step, we do a step per video. And as we go along, we're completing a worksheet at a time in the tokenomics design canvas. So each video pertains to a step and each step has its own resources, has its own worksheet in the tokenomics design canvas. Before we dive into incentive mechanisms, which is one of the most fascinating pieces of tokenomics and the tokenomics design canvas, let's talk about a, a, a brief overview. So recall that tokenomics is really a way of incentivizing user creation towards a specific goal. Before we answer how much we want to reward users to achieve a, a goal or perform a task, we need to first answer, who do we reward and what do we reward them for, right? What, what are we rewarding them to do or what are we rewarding them uh, for doing? Uh, before we can, we need to understand that before we can answer things like, you know, what should the emissions rate be or how much rewards should we give out? Bad incentives redistribute value instead of create value. So I'm sure that you can all think of a common, you know, pump and dump type of project, uh, a Ponzi-nomics type of structure. What do these have in common? They have incentives that highly, highly, highly incentivize, right, users to come in and their economic value gets distributed from uh, later comers to earlier comers. So it's not really creating any value for anyone. It's just redistributing the economic benefit of someone who joins the ecosystem later to someone who joined the ecosystem earlier. That can work in terms of growing the protocol very quickly for a limited amount of time, but because it's only redistributing value instead of creating value, it's inevitably going to slow down. It's inevitably going to be um, a, a something where there's a downturn or a pause, and then the process unwinds itself because there's no value created. There's no there's no fundamentals supporting it. You're just redistributing value. Um, it's it, it's it's doomed from the beginning. A good example that everyone can relate to of bad incentives is also Amazon's famous hire to fire. So uh, Jeff Bezos intending to make Amazon a more competitive place to work, right? Where people, the, the best people are working, um, instituted basically quotas for how much turnover there should, there should be. And so you as a manager would get rewarded if you are firing a certain amount of employees, presumably because that means you're, you know, cutting out the weakest uh, employees. However, what actually happened was many managers would simply hire bad employees Pur purposely in, in order to fire them, right? Intending to always fire them. And so you didn't actually get any benefit. All you got was kind of managers paid more for not really adding any value to the system. So this is all, this is key, right? You bad, uh, bad incentives don't result in value being created. They're not creating value. They're just redistributing value. In this case, in Amazon's case, distributing value from the company, the managers, you know, bad managers in Ponzi-nomics from redistributing value from latecomers to early comers. Good incentives, on the other hand, reinforce healthy user behaviors, right? Sustainable uh, behaviors and drive adoption and reinforce growth. So good incentives make a good product even better and align, um, uh, align behaviors and contribute to creating more value. Mapping out your incentive mechanisms help avoid these unexpected bad outcomes like in Amazon's case and identifies what you need to model and balance in your tokenomics. And this is vital because incentives can make or break your entire tokenomics and your entire product. So you need to design them carefully and you need to test them. And the incentive mechanisms worksheet helps us do just that. It helps us lay out what are the incentives and identify what do we actually need to go and model further and balance. So this worksheet isn't going to answer in quantitative terms, right? 
what exactly should our parameters be and what do we need to do, but it will answer in qualitative terms, what incentives do we need to use? And then it will tell us what questions we need to go and quantitatively model in order to balance those incentives, in order to find equilibriums. And so as you, as you can see, we have the same we have the same role column here as we've had uh, in in all these worksheets. But I'm going to use a slightly different example for for the sake of simplicity, for the sake of making this video uh, a, a bit shorter, because the the curve example would be quite complex with its incentives. And so we're going to look at just a simple DAO governance example where there are DAO members and then there are malicious or bad actors right outside the DAO who want to harm the DAO. And what we're going to do is we have our roles that we have for each of these worksheets. And we're gonna fill out columns A through G for each role first. So A through G, we're not gonna fill out columns H or I just yet until we finish uh, every row. And so what are the desired behaviors for DAO members? What do we want them to do? Well, we want them to be highly engaged when it comes to voting, right? We want them to participate in governance votes. Why do they don't why don't they do that? What are the frictions to DAO members participating in governance votes? Mainly that it's time consuming, right? It's a pain in the butt. It demands their time. They have to constantly check what's what's going on. They have to research is this a good proposal or not? And they have to vote. So it's time, it's time consuming. What do we not want these DAO members to do, right? What's an undesired behavior is abstain from voting. Now, in this simple case, it happens to be the, the opposite of high voting, but that's not always going to be the case. There could be uncorrelated uh, desired and undesired behaviors. And the motivations for the undesired behaviors, right? Why do DAO members do this undesired behavior? Well, to save time. So now we think about what can we incentivize and what can we disincentivize or punish in order to get these this role to do our desired behaviors more and do less of our undesired behaviors. And so what we could consider doing is rewarding voter engagement, right? So maybe we have some tokens uh, that, we, that we emit to people when they vote. Now you already might be thinking about problems with this approach and that's exactly the point of this exercise, but let's get to that in a second, right? Right now we're just laying out the incentives and disincentives that we could that we could theoretically or hypothetically use. So let's say we reward vote engagement, all else equal, that should lead to more engagement. And let's also say we punish a lack of vote engagement, perhaps we slash or perhaps we um, lead people, you know, they have um, co coins that are staked or, or, or in the process of vesting, perhaps they're either slashed or their vesting period takes longer if they do not vote, if, if they are not engaged. So those, those are, that's one incentive and one disincentive we can use uh, for achieving more of our desired behaviors and, and uh, limiting our undesired behavior. Again, before we go to columns H and I, we're going to fill out the row now for uh, the next role. And so in this, in this context, we have our bad actors. We want these bad actors actually to not vote, right? We don't want malicious or uninformed parties to vote in governance votes. So we want them to not vote. And there's not really anything preventing them from doing from you know from doing that it, that's kind of the default right it's kind of the default of not not voting we don't want them though to try to sabotage the protocol the, the DAO, right we don't want them to vote on bad proposals or we don't want them to make uh bad proposals right that will try to harm or could harm the DAO. And so you'll notice like here th these are not exactly quite polar opposites right like it's one thing to not vote it's another thing to um, make actively make a bad proposal to sabotage the DAO. So we don't want that to happen. And their motivation for doing this is profit, basically, right? Maybe there's a way they've, they've shorted the token and they're trying to harm the DAO or something like that. There's money would be the motivation in, the, in this example. Now we want to think about how can we incentivize or disincentivize these undesired and undesired behaviors? Well, there's not really too much to incentivize, but in this case, we could disincentivize the sabotaging by punishing bad voting. I'll get, to, I'll get to how we define that in a second, or having some kind of minimum size, minimum kind of a size of, of tokens required to propose, propose a vote. So that we're putting a financial or economic cost uh, on being able to proposing a vote, which would all else equal lead to fewer bad proposals. 
a few proposals in total, which is, you know, which is a trade-off. So what do I mean by punish bad voting, right? Well, in theory, at least, we would want to punish people who are just voting on uh, bad proposals, voting on proposals that hurt the DAO that are obviously bad. And so there's a subjective question, right, of like, how do we think about bad voting? And so we can answer this in a second as we as we think through the conflicts between these, these uh, different mechanisms, because something like bad voting is going to be a bit subjective. So the next step to filling out this worksheet is to now go one by one, row by row, and fill out columns H and I. And so to fill out column H, mechanism conflicts, we're going to look at all the incentive mechanisms and disincentive mechanisms we're using for DAO members and think about, do those have any conflicts with each other? or conflicts with other mechanisms that for other roles. And so in this case, we want to reward voting engagement, right? So the DAO members vote more. However, rewarding voting engagement would also encourage bad actors to vote, which we don't want. So we have a bit of a conflict already, right? And you probably picked up the, on this right away that rewarding voting engagement is gonna to lead to spam and low quality engagement. Additionally, punishing a lack of engagement, which we propose as a disincentive mechanism, could encourage spammy, low quality engagement, right? Because we're saying not only are we encouraging engagement, but we're punishing you if you don't vote. So rather than go and research everything and do a good vote, you're probably just going to say, okay, fine, I'll vote, but I don't know what I'm doing, but I don't want to get punished. So how do we resolve these things, right? How do we think through uh, solving this, balancing this, and what could we test or optimize to do so? Well, in theory, we could slash losing voters, bad voters, we'll get to this in a second, answering this, what makes a vote bad, but in theory, we could slash bad voters and pay a portion of that to winning voters, to good voters. And we could pay an earlier, uh, we could pay a higher portion to earlier voters, right? Because if we're slashing bad voters, you might, you might wait to vote. You might say, I'm not going to vote yet because I don't want to get slashed. But if you reward earlier voting more, then there's a counter mechanism so that I would want to vote earlier, all else equal. And so we'd want to model here what percentage of things are, that we slash are we paying to early voters, right? So we want to do some kind of quantitative modeling next to balance these parameters that we've identified that we need to, that we need to balance. Before we do that, though, let's complete the next, uh, let's complete the next row. So... What are the conflicts here? Well, we don't want to discourage non-malicious token holders from voting, right? We don't want to punish good voters. And punishing bad voters could encourage this wait and see approach, right? So if there's a risk that if I vote, I'm getting slashed, all else equal, I'm not going to vote. And so we saw you know, how we would balance that uh, here in the, in the resolutions and open questions. So what can we do here? So we could slash losing voters where the size of the slash scales with the degree of the loss of the vote. So what do I mean here? Imagine a vote where proposal, uh, imagine a proposal is made that is a good proposal and people have a healthy, organic, natural um, uh, disagreement about it. That would probably be closer to a 50-50 vote than if someone made an obviously bad sabotage proposal where you would probably be, get defeated like 90% to 10% vote, right? And so what I'm saying is you can slash bad voting, i.e. losing voting, based on how much they lose. So that if someone votes, if someone votes no on a proposal that gets support of 90%, they get slashed more than if it only got the support of 50% or 60%, right? And so you have this dynamic that uh, punishes the extreme outlier opinions and rewards people reaching consensus and voting early. And I'm not saying that this is the only approach or this is the best approach, right? The, the point of the incentive mechanisms worksheet is not to identify um, only one possible thing that we could do or the best possible thing that we could do. It's to highlight these open questions. It's to highlight the mechanisms that we could use. It's to highlight the resolutions and the equilibrium points that we need to go model. And in this case, you know, as we've seen in recent years in, in, in democracies all over the world, 
Um, when you have fringe opinions get too powerful, there can be risks to the democratic process as a whole, the governance process as a whole. And so it's quite reasonable to propose slashing extreme opinions and giving those rewards and thus giving more governance control to people who reach consensus, right, who have the best uh, thoughts in mind for the protocol itself. And so by completing this worksheet, we've identified not only incentive mechanisms that we can put in place to have a healthy balance for governance for this protocol, but also we've identified specific parameters that we'd want to go value, uh, we, excuse me, that we'd want to go model in order to best strike an equilibrium a best uh, strike a, 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 a adoption for this model. And so in this case, we'd go, we need to go and answer what percentage do we pay early to early voters and how much should losing voters be slashed, right? And these are things that we can combine a little bit of quantitative modeling with a little bit of polling our existing community to get their thoughts, right? And these could even be governance parameters themselves that are voted on in future governance votes. So that's a simple example of incentive mechanisms. I would encourage you guys to, to think through this sheet for the curve example, right? What are some, what are some mechanisms that curve uses in conflicts and resolutions? Um, that being said, ne up next, we'll talk about supply policy, right? As we've seen in all these videos, you might get to incentive mechanisms and realize, oop, I need to go back a step or so and change some stuff. That's completely normal. Just make sure you update every single step uh, after that that you go back through. And all these resources, including the tokenomics design canvas, are available at these links. And uh, we'll see you in the next video on supply policy.